And indeed, one of the um, pleasures, if that's the right way to describe it, of the long haul from, uh, from UK on the plane <clears throat> is that I, I get catch up on reading. And this time I was uh, catching up on a, a, a book which um, I rate very highly. It's, it's uh, a philanthropy reader and uh, was drawn together by Beth Breeze, who's a friend of mine at University of Canterbury in the UK, and Michael Moody of the Johnson Center for Philanthropy in the USA. And I recommend it to anyone who's uh, wanting to get to grips with um, both the complexity and the opportunities of philanthropy. Uh, and to avoid some of the more um, disastrous, albeit well-intentioned uh, and well-meaning philanthropic interventions that have gone wrong. It's also a helpful reference for those wanting to understand more about why this curious balancing problem between philanthropy, which is, in a sense, the love of humanity or voluntary action for public good, an activity with that can be so admirable and achieve such great things, but can also generate such criticism uh, skepticism, suspicion. Um, philanthropy has been described, for example, as the recognizable mark of a wicked man. Uh, and some years ago, George Washington in the US asserted that philanthropic enterprises could over time become potent engines, engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men, it's always men, will be able to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, which is pretty strong words. And the doubts are not just historical and they're not just uh, restricted to the US. Concerns and ambivalence about the dangers of undemocratic power being exercised through philanthropy uh, are raised throughout the world. And in some ways, they're legitimate concerns in many cases about philanthropic activity not being sufficiently exposed to accountability or to transparency. These may be perceptions, but they're they may not be the truth, but they are perceptions that are keenly felt by many. And the ambivalence is illustrated uh, by Julia Unwin, formerly CEO of the Joseph Andrew Foundation in the UK, who is one of our best, I think, thinkers about philanthropy, uh, particularly about how philanthropy can address issues of poverty and lack of opportunity. Uh, and she wrote, um, let's make sure I make this work. Yeah, great. I was going to try and use a mouse and I played with it a bit and found it was so sensitive that every time I hiccuped, about six slides went by. So I, I thought I'd revert to the old traditional keyboard. But uh, Julia wrote this, let's acknowledge that philanthropy is not ever an unalloyed good. Philanthropy can represent what's best of us, quite literally the love of others, the use of time, talent and money to benefit others. It's the best possible example of intergenerational wealth transfer making decisions in one generation to benefit and sustain future generations with no regard for return, for popularity or for gratitude. But it can also represent what's worst about us. Philanthropy can be a sort of detached benevolence, knowing best and using the power of money to drive change. It can be another manifestation of the privileged and closeted elites, making decisions for others with too little thought about the consequences, disconnected, illegitimate and out of touch. Strong words. But as these comments illustrate, foundations and philanthropists, therefore, are not operating in a completely rosy and uncritical environment. Uh, participants in philanthropy need to be ready to respond, but also to respect the concerns that may be voiced, sometimes views that are often unvoiced by people who are the beneficiaries of philanthropy, but felt by them. Uh, and they're felt within the communities with which partnerships need to be built if philanthropy is to be effectively directed. So that's one slightly critical starting point. Another is uh, respecting learning from the past. Uh, we have recently, I know in Australia there are versions of this too, but in recent decades in Europe there's been a lot of debate, writing and fulminating about what tends to be labelled new philanthropy which is seen to be challenging what was the orthodox stuck in the mud, old philanthropy. And again, the Philanthropy Reader Anthology shows that that debate is not restricted to the last couple of decades, but has always been a feature of the philanthropic world for centuries. It also shows, which is uh, intriguing and important, that almost all the uh, activities which are labelled new philanthropy have well-established precedents from often centuries ago. Indeed, I reckon one of the best case studies of um, strategic matched or leveraged giving 
where philanthropy brings in other money to support something. It can be found in a letter from Pliny the Younger written in 100 BC. So philanthropic debate is no, not, no longer, is not just restricted to those who regard themselves or are described as new philanthropists. And other examples, of course, abound. The emergence of uh, philanthropically backed microfinance schemes, the first in the world, was in Italy in the 10th century. Uh, the use of 5% philanthropy in the UK to build homes for the industrious poor. Interesting, it was 5% philanthropy, it was a gift, but you got a 5% financial return. Something we're now having debate about again, a hundred and whatever it is years later. Uh, the uh, funding of the purchase of the land and the building of the Royal Marsden Hospital in London, which is the Britain's leading cancer hospital, uh, was funded with an interest-free loan from Angela Money Coots. It's a wonderful name that she was. Uh, she's from the Coots banking family. I think if you're a banker, to be called Money Coots is a, is a pretty good, pretty good name. Um, and in the 20th century, of course, uh, philanthropic funds and effort were behind some of the most notable social justice campaigns, few of which were welcomed by the governments or the establishments of the day. The Rosenwald Fund, for example, which built 5,000 schools and teachers' homes in the southern states of America in the 20s and 30s. Uh, interestingly, the Rosenwald Fund was a spend-out fund. He spent a lot to do that. Uh, again, resonating with debate in philanthropy today about funds not necessarily having to be there in perpetuity. There are many foundations across the world that supported the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Um, the initiation and the continued support, again globally, for hospice care emerged almost entirely from philanthropic endeavours. Even the commissioning by the Carnegie Foundation of Sesame Street, the first TV show to achieve demonstrable gains in early childhood learning. All of these were transformational initiatives achieved and in every case funded by foundations. So philanthropy in that sense is timeless and through the endeavours it supports can have profound and lasting impact. But it has also often involved the use of charitable resources to challenge and to disrupt the powers that be, to create space for the voiceless to be heard and their stories to be told, and to generate data which can then inform and support attempts to achieve social, environmental, cultural, political change. And that brings me really to the themes of this session. It's timeless philanthropy, but also the discussion is timely. Um, some quite big current topics I was given to try and cram into the space I've got. Um, uh, topics which are an important debate to be having constantly within philanthropy, and they're these. What can philanthropy contribute to solving intractable, wicked problems like poverty or climate change? Accountability. What are the responsibilities of private wealth as it seeks to resource the public good? Advocacy. Should philanthropy be bolder in expressing political opinions uh, or political points of view, uh, helping preserve civic space, funding social movements? And what more can philanthropy do to ensure that the sustainable health of the not-for-profit sector? And what is philanthropy doing well? And what do we need to do better? Now, each of those questions will be the subject of an entire symposium, and uh, therefore we'll be a little bit sketchy to try and get all through them in the time I have. And I've touched on a few already, and no doubt we'll pick up on some of them in the Q&A as well. But I wanted to try and pull out some generic themes that in some ways can inform or underpin discussion of any of those. And my themes include these, in particular, the place and legitimacy of the use of philanthropic resources, the impact on contemporary philanthropy of the arrival on the scene of a host of newly wealthy people, bringing with them a business and financial culture that is not necessarily a comfortable fit with the nonprofit world. And also the relationship of philanthropists and foundations with the parts of society, the peoples and the communities that are at the heart of where their philanthropy is directed and of how to ensure that mutuality, respect and trust are central to those relationships. And finally, the behavior of philanthropists and foundations, the ways they work and organize themselves, how philanthropists and foundations can do so much to enhance the prospects for successful and sustainable outcomes of the work they want to see achieved and the organizations and the people they support, how it's perfectly possible for two plus two in philanthropy to equal five and be all the more rewarding for it. But also how easy it is for thoughtlessness, for impatience, for lack of understanding, 
in appropriate processes to undermine the implementation of the mission their philanthropy is intended to make real. How two plus two in philanthropy can, on occasion, only add up to three. And that's just not just in effectiveness, it's also in satisfaction for those involved on both sides of the transaction. And even if philanthropy at its core is a combination of simple and straightforward human behaviors, its potential impact and legitimacy are profoundly shaped and influenced by the circumstances and the context within which it is attempted and carried out. Opportunities and obstacles for successful philanthropy vary from decade to decade, but also from place to place. It's not a, a one system fits all process. And there is no philanthropic bubble operating that's neatly removed from the world outside. Philanthropy exists in a often confusing and difficult context. And philanthropic resources are scarce, they're precious. Um, in the face of the huge challenges that foundations and philanthropists so often would like to see addressed. And surely that must mean ensuring those resources are deployed in ways that they're ambitious and far-sighted, nonetheless take full account of contemporary circumstances and the reality outside the philanthropic bubble, as it were. The position and attitudes, for example, of government at all levels, uh, the space for philanthropic and social entrepreneurship to explore and to develop new activities or to strengthen to, and to extend existing ones, and the various competing, perhaps irreconcilable interests that embrace all the complex and wicked social, cultural and environmental challenges that each philanthropist and every foundation is seeking to tackle. And I believe that imposes an obligation on uh, foundation leaders to take time and effort to develop processes and ways of working that are not only fit for purpose, but are transparent and regularly open to review by those they are intended to assist. To work alongside and to engage creatively as appropriate with the organizations and people we support to acknowledge the fantastic potential of co-design between those with resources and those with uh, ideas to ensure our need for reporting and accountability adds value and not burden on those that we fund uh, too often we have found in the uk that when examined foundation systems present the organizations they're supporting with often very expensive and time-consuming obligations which aren't necessarily serving either organization's purpose. And we would wish to see accountability be much more mutual. And finally, to learn from and share and apply the lessons of our own experience and of the organizations we support openly and explicitly in order not to repeat mistakes, but also to ensure that every action we take is better and more productive than the previous one. I just add a little bit about the UK context where obviously I'm based and therefore most of my learning has been achieved. And it's a, it's, a, it's a context which is especially challenging at the moment for philanthropy and foundations. Uh, it's become, UK has become a fairly bewildering place, not just because of Brexit, although that clearly is causing pretty chronic paralysis. Uh, we're in the midst of an era of very difficult economic and political uncertainty. Uh, a souring of social discourse uh, and exacerbated social divisions within a community which has not seen the like of that for many decades. We seem as a society to be turning inwards on ourselves and there is an accelerated hysteria about the other. People who think differently or who have escaped to the UK from war or famine or oppression. There's a sort of narrowing of uh, attitudes matched by loss of public generosity and openness. For many of the countries become a rather unpleasant, uh, a fearful place. Uh, I heard somebody in a large charity talking rather ruefully a week or so ago, describing what he felt was happening was that civil society was becoming increasingly uncivil. Um, and that's, well, it's a sad place to be operating from that point of view. But it's also a time when the real wages of much of the working population are no better, indeed even lower, than they were a decade ago when the great financial crisis happened. The housing shortage is bad and getting worse. Social and health care are buckling under the combined pressure of reduced or frozen funding and increasing need. And for the first time in my lifetime, the younger working generation is likely to be poorer than their parent, parents at their age, and in some parts of the country is likely to die younger than their parents. So the consequences of causes 
of many of those economic and social challenges, which are intensely felt, have been the focus of an enormous amount of philanthropic effort in the UK in past decades. Uh, it's not surprising that the recent turmoil we're experiencing has been quite a big jolt to many foundations, mm -hmm. having to reflect on effectively their misreading of what's going on in the communities they've often tried to target their philanthropy at. They've had to rethink the philanthropy, or they are having to rethink the philanthropic relationship with the state at all levels. Um, and they're having to rewrite their own script as some of them or their previous interventions have been found either to be fragile, ineffective, or easily undermined and not sustainable. Moreover, we're, we're seeing in the UK an accelerating lack of trust in almost every type of institution or profession. And the charity sector has certainly not escaped this destabilizing fall in public trust. It's also been prone, sadly, to shooting itself in the foot rather too often with crass and insensitive fundraising methods that you may have read about, and has provided plenty of governance messages, messes for the media to pick at or to ridicule. Uh, even foundations and philanthropists are not immune to media and public mistrust about where the money came from, about the privileges linked to that money, and how they use it. Social media exposure can be relentless once it grabs hold of a particular target, and philanthropy has not escaped being among those targets. All involved in philanthropy, therefore, I think, have to uh, demonstrate its legitimacy in action. That means investing in top quality data and communications, reporting publicly on the work that uh, is being done under the philanthropic banner, applying the lessons uh, to subsequent practice transparently, providing opportunities for neglected and often powerless communities and groups to tell their own story, using the experience and knowledge of the philanthropists to challenge media or politically driven distortion. In the new philanthropy I mentioned earlier, some of them have acquired huge personal wealth in recent decades in the UK. I mean, huge, mega. Um, that's something like we've never seen before in the UK since the 18th or early 19th century. And they bring with them not only, but also been achieving that wealth younger than would be the case in previous generations. They bring with them not only new wealth, uh, but new energy and ambition into philanthropy. And this can be a breath of fresh air, um, disruptive often, perhaps, but it can be inspirational in its ambition and determination. The new look saying, well, why on earth can't we achieve this? What is stopping us? Uh, and getting their money and their energy behind trying to do so. But as Catherine Fulton, who's another philanthropy, philanthropy commentator, I commend you if, you're, if she's not already on your reading list. As she wrote or cautioned, those with the power to make philanthropic decisions are often those who have the least direct knowledge about the problems and opportunities being addressed. When such power is exercised, applicants for fund often have to bite their tongues in response to what they see as wrong but unquestionable assertions by funders, or feel they must twist their stories and reports to fit the funders' version of how the world should look. Many of the new philanthropists uh, bring a mindset developed in their business or financial services careers, which can reduce philanthropy to a set of transactions, usually linear and direct and sort of apparently uncomplicated. But the, I suppose they, and also they tend to argue that charities should be more businesslike, whatever quite that means uh, in their strategy, their organization and their behavior. But the reality of running mission-driven organizations like charities and non-profit organizations and foundations is that successful action is almost always going to be relational rather than transactional. Uh, attribution and therefore actions tend and have to be multifaceted and blended. It's not a simple line of do this and that will happen. And there is no single bottom line in philanthropy that can be, can be relied on to provide a straightforward reference point to measure success. Measurement is often one of the mantras at the heart of the new philanthropy, uh, but seems often to consist, at least initially, often of a measurement of very simple quantitative outputs, not the exploration of long-term outcomes or of particular interventions. 
I, I remember hearing and almost falling on the floor with despair, um, a very proud philanthropist, lovely man, but um, on this particular issue, I would argue deluded, uh, talking with great triumph about the numbers of lives touched by the endeavors of that particular foundation. Uh, that's not a measure of anything, but that was what was binding his ambition together, the numbers of lives touched. And Julia Unwin, who I quoted earlier, takes a very firm line on this issue of measurement in her, again, very good pamphlet called The Grant Making Tango. When she writes, there is a danger of funders' enthusiasm for impact measurement becoming a frequently absurd pseudoscience, a misguided attempt to quantify the abstract, an issue that has been over-intellectualized, made too complicated, and being confused with notions of numerical measurement. And uh, Darren Walker, who some of you will be aware is, is head of the Ford Foundation, he, um, he wrote, uh, he went further really than Julia did, um, and said, our sector's obsession with quantifiable impact and frequently dogmatic adherence to discrete deliverables undercuts the expansive purpose of civil society organizations, miniaturizing them in their ambition. In other words, the system is rooted in transactional short-termism, what he described as a tyranny of donors, it distorts and inhibits rather than unleashes the potential of civil society. I would argue that both are right in their criticisms of, of the behavior and demands of some funders in relation to measurement, but both would be worried if people thought they were arguing that good impact measurement is not an essential feature of good management practice in the nonprofit sector. And good, purposeful and inspirational management and the effective use, therefore, of scarce charitable resources depends on such measurement, I would argue, being at the heart of any well-run organization, especially so if it is trying to address a tough social challenge or assist an underserved community. And therefore, supporting that organization should depend perhaps more on the answer to the question about how do you measure your progress and your work and your movement towards your objectives rather than the appeal to the heart of pictures which are very graphic and uh, uh, certainly grab the heart but don't necessarily tell you whether or not the numbers of lives touched are being really influenced. The best way to resist some of the simplistic demands of some of the new philanthropists and some corporate donors is as you here in Australia for the non-profit sector itself with help from philanthropy to develop impact and outcome measurement resources which are accessible, appropriate, and relevant to charities and social enterprises. That way, the demands of, for measurement from funders can be anticipated and met full on and with confidence. And the performance of the charities and enterprises engaged in that will almost certainly themselves benefit. Another theme, this is all bad news, it gets better towards the end, I promise you. Uh, another theme is that of what some have called self in, the need for self-imposed excellence. If some of you may be aware of or have read uh, the book co-authored by Tom Tierney um, called Give Smart, which is again a, a book worth looking at. And he asserts that the natural state of philanthropy is one of underperformance. Gosh, excellence must be self-imposed in philanthropy, he goes on. There are no built-in systemic forces to motivate continuous improvement. Self-imposed accountability is not a natural act. It requires extraordinary determination and discipline to pursue outstanding results year after year when nothing in the surrounding environment, no market as it were, requires you to do so. That's I think a huge challenge to leaders in philanthropy. And a contributor to um, a recent survey by the Center of Effective Philanthropy, which, which Sue mentioned, um, and as I say, is another source, although US focused, of some very interesting debate about how philanthropy can be delivered well and effectively. They did, they did a survey of, um, of uh, CEOs of a number of foundations, one of whom described running a foundation as being a comfortable perch on which it's easy to sit back and go on doing good things, well applauded and recognized as good, but never attempting to really test and push at the boundaries of possibilities of change reluctant to get in to take risks and reluctant too to get into uncomfortable positions. And the same research revealed an interesting paradox at the heart of US philanthropy anyway. Um, two thirds of the foundation leaders, foundation CEOs, reckon it is possible for foundations to make a significant difference 
which means 33% of them can't, which always seems rather depressing. But anyway, two thirds said they could make a significant difference, but only 13% thought they were actually making a significant difference through their financial. That seems a, for me a huge aspiration gap. It really requires some unpicking. Why is it that this is a sort of uh, risk averse, is there a fear of failure, a boards being very conservative, a lack of ambition? I don't know, but it was, uh, it was an extraordinary statistic. And the same survey found that 57% uh, of CEOs thought foundations needed to change to a large extent to address society's future needs. And 41% thought they had to change to a moderate extent, which means that 98% are saying change must happen within foundations if their work is to be more relevant to today's challenging and changing circumstances. But only 14% thought it was likely that foundations would change in the way that they were describing. And 22% thought it, it was unlikely. I'd be, I'd be anxious actually about uh, the results of a comparable survey in the UK of UK foundations. I think the results might be not a lot different. I wonder what would be the situation here. Anyway, given all those uh, criticisms, I thought it was very important to have the second half of the talk looking at top quality philanthropy. Um, and anyway, I'm on a soapbox, so I have that privilege to, uh, to uh, rant and rave about what could be done better. Um, and what do I reckon are the indications of excellence? How do those, it were, the best in philanthropy behave, looking around not just the UK, but certainly in the rest of Europe too? And therefore, what behaviour can not-for-profits, for charities, potential applicants, what behaviour can they expect of foundations they're dealing with if those foundations are top league performers? So here's my, uh, my top 10 list of top quality performances among the leadership uh, among foundations. That they, or rather that you, um, will first have clarity of purpose that is coherently informed and shaped by values and evidence that's actively shared, reviewed and refreshed internally. So it's a constantly topic of debate and that it's communicated externally, vividly and relevantly. So the sectors within which the philanthropy is directed can get a very clear picture of what that particular philanthropist, that particular foundation is trying to do at this time. That you will go for what I call double impact funding. Um, i.e. if uh, you and your trustees uh, wish to provide funds to alleviate an immediate need or an immediate lack of opportunity, then okay, go for it, but also simultaneously take steps to support the advocacy, the campaigning or the policy work which could ensure that that need no longer exists or that that opportunity becomes mainstream available rather than exceptional. Third, that you will be prepared to take sites and to put money into trying to secure high level change as well as helping local practical activity to take place to support efforts to influence the behavior of those in power or positions of power who could make the changes that might improve the long-term prospects of those your philanthropic funding is intended to assist to enable truth to speak to power is a legitimate use of charitable and philanthropic funds in this country, as in the UK, if it is neutral of party politics, if it's non-partisan, and it withdraws on profit of evidence and real voices, that you will always look to help build and generate activity that, if successful, can be sustainable and have continuing and lasting impact, not be short-termism in your vision. So that even if your first, perhaps tentative, interventions and explorations and partnerships may have to be short-term project focused. Your intention, if things work out well, is to get behind the organizations that you are aligning with to help them over a longer period of time than might have been the case in the past to translate your hopes as well as their hopes and aspirations into reality. And fifth, that you build a reputation for listening and especially to the communities that you wish to assist, but also to those with relevant experience, other non-for-profits, other foundations. There's no need to slavishly follow any of those people or any of those organizations, but there is a need to understand and to explain the choices a particular foundation makes about why it's doing something in a particular way. And if someone you find is already very active and effective in a particular arena which you and your trustees think would like, you'd like to target, it's worth being willing to get alongside them to collaborate with them, to syndicate to, with them, 
There's no special virtue that I can see in each foundation acting individually to address the same cause or need as others do. It's messy and can often be excessively demanding for the organizations that are being multiply funded. Pooling the money or pooling some of the support can not only achieve lots more, also save the recipient quite a lot of time and money, and it can achieve more than can lots of little separate bits of funding. Six, to invest in your own capacity and skills and governance to a similar standard at least to that which you expect or indeed demand of the organizations that, you, that apply to you for help. Um, and aside on this, some U US research, again, I'm afraid it was US because so, uh, so often so much of the contemporary research is US based, but they had a, a I think a rather cheeky but nice thing. They, they tested the uh, criteria that foundations were applying to determine whether or not an applicant organization would be eligible to apply. What was it governance like? What was it financial planning? What was its track record like? Track record like? What were the leadership like? All those sorts of questions. Uh, and including in, in that would be its attitudes towards employing people, towards issues of diversity and so on and so forth. To user involvement and how transparent and accountable it was and so on. Uh, and they then applied those criteria to the foundations themselves. And not a single foundation would have been eligible to apply to itself because in one way or another, they failed at least one of the uh, fundamental sort of criteria which they were applying to the applicants. So I think it's worth not just investing in your own capacity and skills because that would be useful and you would be a better organization for it. It also, I think, is, has a lot to do with the legitimacy of the foundation towards the communities are trying to support. Use as many resources and assets as you have to help deliver your mission. Grant making is always going to be at the heart of that activity. Uh, but we have a situation in the UK where charitable trusts and foundations are labelled grant making trusts and foundations, as if that's the only thing they can do. Um, and it's not. There are other ways of financing organizational capacity in the nonprofit sector uh, and growth. Uh, it may be through loans, it may be through underwriting, it may be through various forms of social investment. Um, but there are also philanthropic actions that don't involve necessarily the spending of money. Foundations have a potentially enormously important convening and influencing role. They command, if they've collected it well, a lot of information about some often very, very tricky and difficult needs that they can uh, make sure that information and the voices of the communities they're supporting are being heard by people engaged in policy debate. If a foundation is endowed, if it has significant assets of its own, then there may be ways in which the investment strategy can be aligned more relevantly and directly to the philanthropic mission, something which in the UK was never the case until very recently. Investment was over here, giving was over here, never the twain shall meet. Now we're beginning to see people looking at ways in which their investment managers operate, the choices they make, the strategies that have been adopted to see if there are ways they can enhance the use of their resources towards their charitable mission, not just through grant making, but also through the 95% of their wealth that isn't used in any year for grant making. Next, be alert to the impact of your own behavior and processes. I hinted at this earlier. Uh, but listen to feedback and adapt, retain flexibility as time, circumstances, needs of the organizations you're supporting and the communities they work within change. And be suspicious. We used to do this in the foundation I ran in the 90s. We used to um, measure how much of our meetings were spent making decisions about grants and how much was spent on admin and how much was spent actually discussing what we were learning from the work we were supporting. And when we started doing it, sadly, that last category was probably less than 10%. Almost all of our time of our trustees, they came to meetings, they diligently read their papers, and they would spend time arguing about whether or not to give this amount of money to this organization or this amount of money to that organization, rather than in addition, reflecting on, okay, so what have we learned from the decisions we made last year? And how does that guide us into the future? Uh, I, 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 the trustees demanded, which was great, they didn't need much encouragement, uh, that they, must test the way the behavior within meetings to spend to sure ensure that they were not just there to meet our own needs 
they were there to actually help the mission of the organization. And one way of doing that is to just analyze the time you spend on the different functions. Nine is to stay curious. Uh, that comfortable perch I was talking about, um, make it slightly less comfortable. Uh, keep looking for things that may be a little bit of grit into the system, or indeed new knowledge which uh, hadn't been there when you made the previous set of decisions. Uh, encouraging internal talk, encourage talk with the external world. Um, look closely at why, which things are working and which things don't seem to have delivered what you hoped for. Don't just brush it under the carpet or move on to the next thing. Exploit the privileges of philanthropic independence uh, to explore and go where others won't or can't, as they may not have the capacity or the resources or the freedom or the space to do so. The philanthropic uh, privilege is formidable uh, and has the potential to do things which no one else can do. And consider, perhaps, looking beyond charities and non-profit organizations for the delivery of work you want to support. Certainly in the UK, for 85, 90% of all foundations, there is nothing in their governing document, which means they have to spend their grant making through charities. They have to spend it on the charitable activity, but not necessarily through charities. There may be other organizations with social purpose, not necessarily in the charitable sector, who are well placed to deliver a particular development. And 10th, celebrate what you do. Uh, and by your enjoyment, encourage and inspire others to join in and participate and grow the world of foundation and the ambition of, of, of philanthropy. Share the passion that drives your own philanthropy and your foundation's own purposes and mission, because uh, it can be a very infectious thing to do. Thank you.